Okay, you ready? Great. So, um, this talk is going to be about uh, patterns of availability. So, when you make the move into distributed systems, and actually many of us are, will point out have distributed systems by simply having a tiered architecture. In other words, you run a separate um, web server to a database, potentially with a mid-tier as well. You're going to come up with the problem that those tiers are doing inter-process communication, which can fail. And so a lot of this talk is about how you resolve that issue. Um, and we'll look at both what can cause individual tier to fail and how you might fix that, but also what you do when you get experienced tier failure. Um, who came to my talk yesterday? A few of you. The only point I, I tend to highlight is the one on the bottom. That's that people standing here are not smarter than you. They're just more confident, probably. You're just as smart, and the thing we can figure out, you can. Uh, this is where I work. Uh, we do, we're a startup in London, we do collaboration online, uh, mainly for businesses that want to uh, work with people outside the organization, so we're kind of an extra net. Um, the only thing that's important about that is I'm not a consultant. I have nothing to sell any of you. I'm just going to share what I understand about this process. Okay. I will briefly mention microservices just because uh, microservices have made this discussion more relevant. It will be like two slides, and I will get through it very quickly. Um, I will then talk about availability. What is it? What do we mean by saying something is available? Okay. I will then talk about tactics we can use to increase the availability of our site. And then I will finally talk about fault recovery. In the event that something goes wrong, how do we fix that problem? At some point during this presentation, we may do some audience participation with throwing, just throwing some balls around to try and demonstrate patterns. It's really easy. Please don't be afraid to volunteer. Um, the only slight flaw in my ointment usually is that being geeks, many of us can't catch very well. Don't worry, that doesn't really uh, uh, make the problem any worse. But it's usually kind of fun, and it's a different way of showing you the same pattern. Okay. So, I have what I want, to, I, I want to call Cooper's Law of Microservices. And Cooper's Law of Microservices is this. Any talk about microservices first has to define what microservices is. Uh, the reason is that the, there's no general real agreement out there as to what this term microservices means. And that causes a lot of pain and confusion. Generally speaking, though, I think the reason for this problem is that there are people come to microservices from different origins. One of those origins are people that used to do SOA, so uh, service-oriented service architectures. And those people, when they look at the idea of taking a monolith ap application and breaking it up, they say, well, we've done that for years in SOA, so this is just really like SOA++, right? This is Gorilla SOA on steroids. So we're saying, we're not going to use an enterprise service bus. It's all going to be direct communication. We're going to employ things like uh, DevOps culture, uh, you built it, you own it, um, et cetera, right? So those, the SOA guys say, well, we understand this. It's just SOA. It's SOA better. Then there's a school of thought that says, mm -hmm. microservices are very small things. It's just like Unix uh, pipes and filters. It's the way that Unix does commands. And what you want to do is create really tiny things um, and assemble them together. So serverless is the, is the kind of extreme of this kind of model, right? Where effectively you say, I'm just going to deploy everything to Lambda on Amazon and get Amazon to host and run them. And there are only 200 lines of code each. Neither one of these is more microservices than the other. They are just different schools of thought on microservices. Quite often people say microservices is an architectural style. It's not. The reason we can say that quite definitely is because of what an architectural style is. So architectural styles were defined in at Carnegie Mellon University in the, in the 90s. And an architectural style is a way of defining an architecture as a series of components and connectors such that we can compare two styles and determine their characteristics of suitability for being used for different applications. And they talk about essentially the constraints that you have in your components and the constraints that you have in your connectors in order to build a system of that type and the properties that you get. Most definitions of microservices uh, do not essentially conform to an architectural style in that way. What you do see 
is that microservices can be implemented using a range of architectural styles. And so the best way to think of microservices is actually is a goal. It's simply a goal which says I have a monolithic application and I cannot scale my development process because I can't get everyone playing in the same sandpit. So I need to scale my development process by having a lot of sandpits. And the way that I do that is to choose from amongst one of many approaches to producing microservices, depending on my context. Is server better for me? Is a serverless model better for me? That's something you have to decide, but they are all equally microservices. I need to get away from this uh, argument of, it's not a microservice if it has more than X many lines of code. It's not a microservice if it's not a bounded context. It's just a goal. Microservice is an organizational goal. The reason, and reason it's important to this talk is more people, because of microservices, are now having to deal with distributed systems. And, and, and many of those people don't come from a background of the problems that that brings, and they can walk into it quite naively without understanding what do you have to do to make distributed systems highly available. Okay? So this talk will give you an idea of how you do that. Um, it, and the other point on the slide is, even if you're not doing microservices, if you've got multiple tiers, you have a distributed system. So these patterns are just as helpful to you. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what is availability? What do we mean by that term? So we'll start with a fault. A fault is essentially when something goes wrong in your software. So it's something that throws an exception at runtime. It's where essentially you don't meet the specification that the system is basically set out for. Okay. So a fault is something just going wrong. We tend to think of that as a bug. You said there was a bug in the software. Something has gone wrong. Okay. An error is when that fault causes the system to deviate from specification. Why is there a difference? Well, let's say I basically throw an exception and I catch that exception and I deal with the problem and the software continues running. I had a fault, but I do not have an error. Right? I mitigated the error by taking some compensating action and that compensating action meant that effectively I do not have an error. Some faults, it is important to understand, can be dormant. So just because you don't have an error today doesn't mean you won't do tomorrow. And there are a number of common reasons. One is code that's never been run, right? I'm sure all of you have had the experience of getting a bug report, investigating, and looking at the code and going, I don't know how this could ever have worked. And it probably hasn't. It's probably never been run. The second reason eventually faults become dormant is that the fault only occurs under load. So when you actually run the system and you're just testing it and you've got one tester banging away at it, no fault appears. But when thousands of users flood into the system and try and use it, things go wrong, right? Because the assumptions that you've made when testing at very low scale don't hold true at high scale. So you run out of memory. Um, you uh, find basically you have errors of concurrency when talking to a database. Okay. And the final one is essentially a fault that occurs over time. So quite often when we're testing, we don't test basically over a period of time, so we don't notice things like resource leaks. Resource leaks are much less common than they used to be with managed runtimes, but resource leaks do still occur, and they will harm your system unless you have infinite resources, which most of us don't have. Failure. So we define failure as an error that becomes observable. And by observable, we don't necessarily mean just a human operator, but it could be another service, another system talking to yours. But something outside of the service boundary notes that you have essentially an error. It propagates beyond your boundary. Okay? And that effectively is a failure. It's an unmitigated error. So we define availability as the ability of a system to essentially mitigate faults so they don't become errors, so they don't become failures that are observable to the end user of the system. Have most of you familiar with this kind of notation? 
two, three, four, five, nines. So this is what these numbers actually mean. They refer to a amount of downtime that you can actually have. Okay. So huddle, we aim for three nines. That gives us about 10 minutes of downtime a week. Now, downtime is not scheduled maintenance. Downtime is unexpected outage. Okay, so you fail for whatever reason. Um, you'll note, for example, that an EC2 instance is 99.95. One of the things to note is if what you're trying to achieve is four nines, that's a greater availability requirement than is offered to you by Amazon EC2. So the only way you can essentially achieve four nines if you're running on Amazon EC2 instances is you have to have the ability to cope with that potential failure and mitigate it such that you don't essentially you fail yourself, right? Typically, what we see is people running in multiple availability zones, okay? Because your single availability zone has 99.95 uh, availability. If you want four nines, you're going to have to have a second availability zone you can fail over to if the first one goes down. That's what we mean by availability. So how do we achieve availability? So we can, we can divide the process of trying to become available into a number of steps. The first thing we can obviously do is try and prevent defects from appearing in our software to begin with so that we don't create things that could fail. Okay? The second thing we can do is say, well, when, failure do, when, when, when faults do happen, I want to detect those faults so I can mitigate them and prevent them from creating system failure. And finally, we may attempt to recover from faults that essentially have caused us a problem when we want to say, okay, I don't want the whole system to go down, I don't want to lose my availability, so if part of my system, a given microservice, fails, then can I recover from that and keep going? All right, let's take the first one. So most of us know, even if we don't really practice it, what the good techniques are for fault prevention, I'm sure. So test-driven development, solid principles, pairing, code reviews if you can't do pairing. Um, those are exploratory testing. Those are all really good ways of flushing the defects out of your system and producing higher quality code. Higher quality code, going to have less defects, OK? Um, you can do training. So you can train people and say, we're going to teach you what causes common errors in the code and how to mitigate against them. Right, so we're going to say to you, for example, you know, don't do unbounded requests. Unbounded requests kill you because they work essentially at very low scale. You've no idea whether they're going to work at exceptionally high scale. So you, can, you have to demonstrate what your limit is. Yeah? We'll come on to that later and explain in more detail, but the idea is I could train somebody to fix that. But if you do that, you'll still find that faults will escape, will escape that process. I mean, who here thinks they could use the techniques at the top and get a fault-free system that they run that never has a problem? Yeah. Uh, there's a famous story of a guy who's lecturing about availability, and he says to the audience, okay, if you wrote the software for the plane you are flying home on today, would you get on the plane? And only one guy raises his hand, and the lecturer says to him, you're sufficiently confident in the quality of your team's code that you would get on the plane and fly home. And the guy says, no, no. But if my team wrote the, the code, the plane would never get off the ground. So I'm perfectly safe. Um, and this idea that there's fault-free software is really a bit of a mirage that you're not going to get to. Um, dormant faults are particularly nasty. The ones where essentially because your, your process of QA doesn't wake them up, they come out to bite you later. Okay. So when we talk about these, these dormant faults, these stealth mode faults, that stealth cat there, um, uh, there are some techniques we can use. So concurrency, one of the most basic things to do is multi-user testing. I am constantly surprised by the number of systems that are in production that are not multi-user and no one ever tried to see if they would be. Right? People just sit there saying, I've got one person, he's on the page, he's typing, uh, and no one ever checks, well, what happens if two people try to access the same piece of data or try and submit it at the same time? Okay. So you need to try and flush out uh, concurrency errors. If your system wants to be multi-user, you have to make it multi-user. Um, resource leaks. The best way to really flush them out is essentially to run what we call a soak test. So run a test suite, run it over, say, a weekend, come back on Monday morning, and look at performance counters and say, what happened? 
Did my memory keep creeping up and up and up and up and up? Even though it garbage collected, there's an upward glide slope. That means I'm leaking resources. Okay? So look for those leaks. And finally, essentially data growth. Right? There are all sorts of surprising problems occur when essentially you get data growth. So the classic example would be something like, you know, what happens if I have a parent-child relationship? And at the minute, I'm expecting that parent-child relationship to be something like 1 to 10. Okay? What happens if for some reason as my system get, it enters use and I get explosive growth, which is a good thing, right? I'm suddenly now dealing with one to 10,000. Lots of the assumptions I've made about how my code is written may no longer hold true, particularly if I'm doing something like lazy loading through an ORM. Okay, so you need to test at scale. Um, but even if I say I'm gonna go use all these approaches to try and prevent uh, defects, you're gonna find essentially that faults will happen in production. And most people are saying, you know, particularly if you're in distributed systems, you've really got to accept that you are never going to deploy fault-free software. Given that, what do you do about it? Given that you know your software will not be fault-free. The first thing we want to do is to try and detect those faults. Now, a typical way we might try and think we want to detect faults is when well, I'm gonna log stuff, and I'll use Elk or whatever effectively to monitor my logs or tail my logs. The trouble with that is it's not particularly useful to you to actually react in time. It's a, it's a very good forensic process and it's useful for examining crashes after they occur. It's kind of your black box fight recorder of your plane. Your plane has crashed, I can now see why it crashed. But your plane crashed. Okay? What's more useful is what we call application performance monitoring tools. So application performance monitoring tools, their purpose is to monitor things like resources, CPU, hard disks, memory. Um, they're also there effectively to what usually monitor key transactions in your system. So you set them up effectively so that they say, right, from end to end, this transaction spent time in the following places in your code and in your database. It's also worth looking if you're using basically databases and monitoring tools for those databases to look at, for example, blocking operations. All those things are symptomatic of the health of your system. So uh, we use, for example, New Relic, but there are many other ones available, Nagios, things like that. And you should generally have some kind of monitoring that lets you understand the health of your running application and lets you set up alerts so that you can alert operators to say, there is a problem with the system right now and we need to basically alert somebody because they may be able to eventually prevent those faults becoming failure that the user sees. Okay. So if we can't, if we can't prevent faults from escaping into the wild, one of the things that we want to do when we detect faults is essentially try and recover. We want to build our systems to be robust in the, in the presence of failure. And when we talk about distributed systems, particularly microservices, the key thing that concerns us is essentially cascading of those faults. So when one service fails, what I want to avoid is that fault propagating out to the rest of the system and causing the whole thing to come down and fail on us. So if I say I've got, for example, system A and system B, and B depends on A, if I get a fault in A, and that fault is not mitigated, we don't catch the exception, we don't deal with it, that then becomes essentially an error in A. If then the error in A is not mitigated, it may become a failure. System A fails. System B now has a fault, and that fault is it can no longer talk to system A. If we don't mitigate that fault in system B, we'll then get an error and a failure in system B. And that will propagate throughout the chain until our entire system comes down. And that's what we call a cascade failure. All right, just to change the pace a little bit, we'll talk about cascade failures in other engineering environments. Does anyone know the story of UA Flight 232 very much? Okay, from the front does, okay. So UA 232 essentially is a DC-10, and the DC-10 effectively develops a stress crack in one of its fans. That fan essentially disintegrates, and it, as it disintegrates, it does so violently, and fragments of metal spread throughout the aircraft. And this is back in the time when aircraft flew by hydraulics, not fly by wire, and the metal fragments sliced their way through the hydraulic lines. The fluid leaked out, 
and the pilots lost access to all the control surfaces of the aircraft. They could not use flaps or slats to steer the aircraft at all. So the only way they could figure out to actually steer their aircraft was to vary the throttle on the engines so as to allow them to turn left and right. Okay. And this is some video footage. No one flying home today? Um, this is some video footage. Apologies to those who are flying today. Um, so, the good news is actually that um, 185 people walked away from that, which is quite surprising when you see what the aircraft was actually doing. Um, and the aircraft continued to cascade down the runway, it's in Iowa, until basically it landed in some cornfields. And at first they had no idea that anyone had survived, and then people began to walk out of the corn. Um, the guy who flew it, his name was Captain Al Haynes, he became something of a hero. They tried to recreate what his crew had done to land the aircraft in simulators and nobody could actually uh, uh, make the same uh, flight. So it became known as the impossible landing because no one could actually figure out how they did it. Uh, this guy here is uh, Colonel Nielsen. And Colonel Nielsen essentially found that this boy who had been wandering out of the corner after the accident and carried him to a um, uh, waiting ambulance. Uh, a, st a statue, I think, at the airfield is basically of this particular scene, because an image went around the world quite quickly. The next day, he turned up at the hospital to see how the little boy was doing, and one of the reporters shouted out to him, uh, my God, so you saved that child? And he replied, God saved that child, I just carried him. So, there you go. So that's why we don't want cascade failure, right? Cascade failure is bad. One little bit breaks, and the whole thing comes down around us. So how do, we recover from, how do we recover from thoughts? So we're going to show you the basic techniques you need to understand to recover from thoughts. The first one is about timeouts. Okay, so timeouts are a really simple technique to use to recover from basic thoughts. I'm trying to talk to this other component, and the other component fails. What I need to do essentially is save my component from blocking a thread, waiting for that thing to come back by timing out at a certain point. So, a diagram. So I've got a database. So imagine the database, essentially, the connection pool becomes exhausted. The reason is probably that my connection pool is currently, currently used by the long-running queries on the database. We've had this one happen to us. Right, so I can no longer basically allow you to connect to the database. I no longer have connections in the connection pool. So my mid-tier service then develops a fault. Right? I can't talk to the database. Because if it has no timeout, it will just sit there waiting for its opportunity to talk to the database. It'll just say, I'm going to wait here for a connection to become available. The problem then becomes essentially that I may run out of threads here. Because all my threads are now going to back up waiting to get their connection to the connection pool. Right? And that happens quite a lot faster than you think if you've got volume. The problem then is that the front end can't talk to the mid-tier service. And if it doesn't have a timeout either, it's just going to sit there waiting for the mid-tier service to respond. And it's going to consume all its threads waiting for the mid-tier service to respond. At a certain point, your web tier has no threads available left to service incoming requests. Generally, a modern web server will queue requests for a short period of time before effectively, eventually then says, I can take no more. And your users will see whatever error your web, your web, your web tier produces, right? So if you're in Microsoft Land, it's called a yellow screen of death. Um, that is failure. It's now become observable to the user. And it's really simple to fix. You just time out this operation. You say, I didn't get enough, I didn't get a response quickly enough, so I'm going to release my thread. I'm going to go back to basically the server and say, I couldn't get hold of what you wanted. Okay. On the server, we can sometimes do useful things at this point. We can return a 49 too many requests to the client applications and say, back off because we are struggling with the load. Please do less. All right. Anyone want to volunteer to demonstrate this? Volunteers are good, otherwise I will volunteer some of you. Come on, it's really easy. People in the front row, only three of you. Come on, sir. Up you come. 
Come on, two other people are joining. So it won't hurt you, promise. No one gets hurt. Well, not yet. Uh, come on, one other person. Yay, all right. So you can be my web tier, you can be my mid tier, you can be my database. All we're gonna do is we'll just form a line. All we're gonna do is we're just gonna show a normal request. So we're just gonna pass this ball down and up and down the line. More requests coming in. So you, keep, you pass them back up when you've got on database, you're responding, so the ball comes back. Okay. And now what we'll show you is what happens. The database, what I want you to do this time is just turn your back. So just turn around. His connection pool is exhausted. He's got nowhere to throw it. He's now busy. Yeah, well, he's about to be a fault. Uh, well, he's, he's trying well. <laughs> but eventually, if he wasn't a better catcher, he would fail. And uh, this guy would basically respond to me and say, I, I've got nothing for you. Okay. So an easy response is for this guy to time out. So he just counts the two and passes it back. So just keep your, your back turned to me. Sorry, I'm not, not being unfriendly. Um, okay, so you pass it down. When you catch it, count to two and then pass it back. Okay, so he's giving me back a request saying, I'm getting too many requests now. I can't answer you, your request, but he's still going. Uh, uh, and we, we're still basically getting responses back from the server. Eventually what happens is database, you can turn around again. He becomes available and we, and we move through the system uh, normally. Right, that's a simple timeout. Thank you, gentlemen. We need some more volunteers in a second. Okay, that's a timeout. Um, so, anything you call that does an inter-process call should time out, right? So that parameter that you quite often ignore and go, I have a timeout thing, uh, use it, timeout. Also be aware that some of them have absolute ridiculous uh, defaults, like 30 seconds, right? 30 seconds is not a reasonable amount of time your system to basically idle waiting for a response. Your database quite often should be responding to you in, you know, under 100 milliseconds. If you don't get a response back, then what you need to do is um, ensure that you time out within a kind of reasonable time frame. You can do a trick where essentially if you don't have a timeout on an API, you essentially start a timer, and if your timer essentially finishes and the work hasn't completed, then you time out the operation. Retry. So one of the things about timing out though, of course, is that you don't get a useful response back to the user. And it might be that the fault is transient, will clear itself very quickly. So what we do in that case is we say, well, rather than just timing out, I could retry the operation and see if it would succeed. So for example, a typical case where you might use this is I've got a deadlock on the database. And that deadlock, um, will pass because one of the items will complete, the deadlock will be freed up, and we'll be able to basically make, repeat the call. So a retry is a very common solution to availability problems. Okay. So here again I've got basically my database, and I've got a failed request due to a deadlock locking basically the, a table or a resource that I need. And while my current model says I'm going to time out at that point, I just retry the operation, say, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to retry it. It will probably succeed. All right, let's have a quick demo. Either the same people or different volunteers want to hop up here and we'll do some passing around. Come on, people. Only three. One more. Sorry, people who are hiding, I can see you. I won't pick on you, promise. <laughs> All right, let's form a line. So we'll do the same thing, we just pass up and down. But what we'll do this time is. Just do a quick run so everyone gets the feel for it. Come back. Okay. So database, what I want you to do is turn around, but I want you to count to two and then turn back to face this. And what, what, what I want you to do is essentially retry throwing the ball at him. So request comes in, database is blocked, effectively, but he's gonna retry, ball comes back. Okay? So we keep going with that process. So just, just do a, a couple at a time. Front end, another one coming through. Yeah. 
Right, that's pretty seamless, no one really notices what happened. Okay, thanks gentlemen. Okay. So, if the fault is caused by something essentially that's quite rare, just retry instantly. So, typically it's a network communication error, suddenly for some reason you can't talk over the network. Um, if it's called by basically load, in other words, you're aware that it's a problem like a lock, uh, then essentially you want, to, what to do is have an interval you wait before you retry. Often you do it exponentially and retry a couple of times. Um, and if the fault is permanent, don't retry. The reason we say that is because you're, you're about to launch an application denial of service attack. You're about to, a component is under stress, and essentially you retrying the whole time may only make that worse. Okay, we'll talk about that one next. So there's an idea called a circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker says, the component I'm talking to may be struggling to service requests in a way that if I keep sending more requests to it, they're either going to fall on the floor and we get a lot of wastage, or um, they're going to make it wor the situation worse for the component. So what I want to do is fail fast. I want to say, when I try to talk to that component, we fail. I did a retry maybe, and the retry failed. So I'm now raising a flag and saying, let's not talk to that component anymore. And everybody who comes in now gets told to back off. So every request of that component gets told, leave it alone, and immediately returns the failure. That gives me fast failure, and I can then report again from the front end, from like a 429, and say, okay, we're going to back off, please. So I have a model here, for example. Again, we've got some notion, effectively, that I've got exhausted connection pool. Retrying may not help me because I may have too high a volume of requests. So essentially we've seen this before, I've got a fault effectively because I'm running out of threads. And what I can do here effectively is say, if I might like say timeout, but timeout's going to use resources while I'm waiting for the timeout. Right? So that, the timeout model we showed earlier, the problem is I'm using a lot of resources while I'm timing out. It would be better just to break the circuit and say, I'm going to fail all these requests. And what we're going to pass back to the server is saying we've failed, and you should take appropriate action. So typical appropriate action at this point is 429. The other thing is serving results from cache is quite common. So this is the way, for example, the Netflix uh, application Hysterix works. Hysterix will basically record, if it's a query, record the last results it have with parameters. And in the event of a circuit breaker, it will just start saying, OK, what I want to start doing is serving your results out of the cache instead. Um, Netflix are particularly strong in Hysterix on some of these kind of patterns. Uh, so the circuit breaker stops that request coming through. All right. And what is what a circuit breaker looks like? So circuit breaker has three states. It has closed. That means the traffic goes through it. It has open which means traffic doesn't go through. So it's like this, effectively. That's closed, traffic goes through. Open, traffic doesn't go through. We have a state called half open. That means, essentially, we say, well, let's see now, after an interval, whether we can make that, make that call again. And you close the gate. You let one request through. If the request succeeds, you remain closed. If not, you reopen it immediately. Typically, what happens is you open the gate not for one failure, but for a percentage of failures. You say, a certain percentage of my requests have failed. Therefore, I should basically open the, open the gate. Okay, that's called a circuit break. All right, we can do a. Um, we won't demo that one because with people because it's very just a, a variation we've seen before. Throttling. Uh, throttling will do quickly. So throttling is the problem essentially that um, I my system is reacting badly to load. So here's a typical example of it. I develop a, a call to database. And that call to database is unbounded. In other words, essentially, I don't limit the number of responses that I can get back from the database. The mid-tier may well then develop a fault. So a typical fault you might get, for example, is that I get back far more data than I, expe I expected. I have to allocate memory to deal with basically the largest result set. And because of, say, fragmentation in my, um, uh, uh, in my runtime, I may either fail or at least go into a GC pause to collect. GC pause is equivalent of failure, right? No one can actually talk to this component anymore. And so the result of that essentially is that I take out my mid-tier component, and my mid-tier component fails, obviously that cascades up to my front end. So always be aware of limits. 
Think about the limits of what you want to do. Now, a good rule of thumb here is to say to yourself, what is the, resp what is the response I expect from this API in terms of performance? Usually what you want is an end-to-end -end call should tend to complete in under 250 milliseconds. If, my if, if, my, if I look for the breakpoint at which the number of results that I return would cause my overall call to exceed what I set as my limit, around 50 milliseconds, then essentially I say, well, that's actually my limit. My limit is the point where that gets exceeded, and I won't support requests for larger amounts. So my, orders, my order lines of my order are limited because at a certain point it would exceed the performance budget that I've set for that component. Okay? Always have limits. Unbounded requests are the thing that as you begin to scale, kill you rapidly. Decoupled invocation. Um, decoupled invocation is also really used messaging. So the patterns that we've looked at before, one component expects the other component to be up and available. Right? Yes, those of you who came to my talk yesterday, we referred to that as temporal coupling. An alternative to temporal coupling is to use decoupled invocation. That is, I don't send it to you directly, I put it on a piece of middleware, a message queue, and I'll wait basically for that message, a, a consumer reads off the message queue and process it at some point in the future. And the real advantage of this is it makes it very easy to scale. Because it doesn't matter what the inbound request rate is, I can allocate as many resources as I can manage to consuming the queue. So I can always slow things down and say, okay, maybe the inbound request rate is this, but I just act when I get the request in, I put it on a basically a work queue, and eventually my consumer will read it off the work queue and deal with it. So I can scale to meeting a high number of requests, provided I can accept latency, provided I can accept the response occurs at some point in time. And there are tricks around that. You could say, for example, if it's an order line on the front end, I'll just treat it as though it actually happened and assume that the back end effectively is not going to generate an error. And if there's an error, I can deal with it out of bound with an email or a contact with the end customer. Amazon does this all the time, right? Amazon takes your order. It has no idea whether it's in stock. It has no idea whether your credit card payment is going, going to succeed. But what happens is it gets in touch with you later if it can't, if it can't uh, fulfill your order for some reason. Amazon regards this as an opportunity because for them, it's a chance to contact you, the customer, and demonstrate good service. So here's what happens usually. Given I had some problem, for example, unable to talk to the database due to a lock, one of my uh, a connection pool outage, my normal approach previously was that I would develop a fault, and that fault would propagate through the system. If what I do is put a message queue in here, the message queue can control the pacing. All right, so. If I can have three volunteers again, we'll demonstrate message queue. This is quite a useful one to see. Come on, same three as before, if you like. Come on, guys. Be very quick. Hey, you volunteer? Hurrah! All right. So web tier, mid tier database. What we'll do first of all, we'll just want to show you, remind you of what happens. So if the database turns its back, well, remind you what happens normally is it goes to this guy, this guy's frustrated, and essentially he either basically times out or circuit breaks and pass it back, right? Okay, so what I want you to do this time, sir, is I want you to hold on to the balls, right? Put them in your shirt or something. So you're going to act as a message queue, you're just going to store the requests that come in. Database, what I want you to do is just take balls out of, the, of his collection when you're ready. So you're just reading off the queue when you're ready. So this guy's essentially just storing messages. Whoops. The web tier is not listening to us. And you can see essentially, no matter what rate I pass them at, the database can essentially do with them whatever rate he wants. But obviously, once the database passes them back to the they come up all the way back up the line. Once, once they're done. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so you can see essentially the queue in the middle helps us deal with the issue. So if the database essentially wanted to turn it back for a second, oops, the database just wanted to turn it back for a second, the database is not there, the queue just builds up, right? We're just stacking up items. The database turns around now and starts taking items. We haven't lost any work. So what we tend to refer to is guaranteed at least once delivery. 
right? So we're not going to lose our, our, the valuable requests from our customer, they'll store for later usage. All right, gents, thanks very much. Round of applause for you guys. That's a decoupled indication pattern. Essentially, it's using middleware, like MessageQ, Kafka, RabbitMQ, um, ZeroMQ, something like that, to place it between, essentially, our tiers and use the queue to throttle the rate at which requests come in and ensure, essentially, that we get the ability to, to get guaranteed delivery of those requests. We don't lose them and drop them on the floor. Um, so, as I came to the talk yesterday, that's one of the other reasons why we say prefer messaging over, say, RPC interaction styles. Okay. Now, one of the problems when you get to decoupled invocation uh, can be that the consumer at the far end may not be reading out of the queue fast enough, and the latency builds up. Sufficient amount of latency is equivalent to a network partition, right? Because essentially, two parts of your system now become inconsistent. But we have what we call eventual consistency. You don't want to become too inconsistent, so how do I actually speed up, once I do have a queue, processing? Um, so competing consumers are the answer to that. So what we're showing here is essentially that um, the queue essentially is backing up, and I've become inconsistent. And at the front end, I've got all sorts of problems, like, for example, users have raised orders, and they can't see them in their account history because we haven't pushed it through yet. I'm getting uh, co uh, complaints coming to the system saying, I put this order through 20 minutes ago, I haven't seen it yet. The so competing consumers just says, have multiple readers of the queue. Generally, nearly all the queuing software out there supports having multiple readers reading that queue from the tier. And that increases your throughput. The other advantage it gives you is one of anything is bad. Because when that thing dies, you've lost part of your system. So this now gives us redundancy. Okay, if I lose one of my consumers, I'm still doing work with the other two. And while I reboot that first one or introduce a new, a new node to replace it, the other two can handle, handle, handle the load, so I keep moving. We also find that really useful occasion we get spikes in traffic. For some reason, somebody does an operation that results in a significant amount of traffic load, load on the queue. You can introduce new consumers to help you eat your way through the backlog and then just turn them off when you're done. Okay, so auto-scaling is essentially what we're talking about. Okay. The computer consumers, all we want to do is increase the number of consumers reading from the queue. That still may not be enough. We still may find, essentially, that the um, consumers that we have are not processing the work fast enough because each individual piece of work on the queue is very long-running. So we had this occasionally with things we did about video conversion, for example. A piece of video conversion actually takes quite a while. One thing you can do to do this, essentially, is you can say, well, given the problem of the, the work item on the queue, what I may want to do is actually take that work item and divide it up into some pieces that I can run in parallel. And then I can use queues to essentially distribute that work to new consumers who will perform those operations in parallel. Now, my speed becomes the speed of the slowest part of the operation. I can never get faster than that, but I can concurrently process work. So here we have a system where, effectively, we're saying, I've got my queue, but essentially I'm developing a fault because uh, processing of those items in the queue is too slow. Generally, the machine the consumer is running on is running out of resources, either memory, disk space, I.O. is too slow. So what I do is I say, well, let's break that piece of work up and essentially distribute it by queues to a number of individual processes so you can do the work for us. Okay, so last demo. Come on, guys, three of you, last one. Actually, no, five of you. Come on, last demo. Come on, we get two more volunteers. Two more of you. Come on, people. Uh, okay, so we'll dem we get one more person. One more. It's your chance for fame and glory in, uh, on, on video. One of you? Yay! Okay. So you're giving me the database, you're giving me the web tier. You three guys 
and going to try and do some work in parallel. What you need to do is the piece of work called A, you need to do the piece of work called B, and you need to do the piece of work called C. And all that happens is, I'll be the web tier, and you can be the mid tier. When, when you get it, you're going to put it in your, in your shirt as a queue. Now, all I want you to do is come up, take a ball out, shout A, B, or C is appropriate, and then put the ball back. Well, if we can figure it out, when it's done through A, B, and C, then essentially, if it does the last piece of work, you can pass it to the guy at the end. Just guess, probably. All right. So I'm passing work onto the queue, and we're stacking it up. My parallel workers now come in, and they shout out A, B, or C. Yeah, put it back, because essentially what happens is it has to do all three pieces of work, right? So just shout out your letter when you pick one up. Yep. Yep. Right, so C, B, and A. <laughs> And, and the idea is effectively once you've done all three pieces, you can pass the back end, right? You can just do it once more, and you get the idea. So I'm stacking up the queue. Now my workers are coming in, taking work out the queue, doing their job. They put it back when the, uh, in, in, onto the queue to get the other jobs done. And essentially, I've paralyzed the work across all three of them. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. So that's. Parallel processing. Okay, so you break the task up into a series of sub-steps, and you basically use queues to distribute that work to your consumers. There's a real advantage here as well in terms of monitoring. If you have a large piece of work, and you're reading a queue from those large pieces, and it takes you a while to process it, it's very difficult to understand where that consumer, if you have a single one, where it is in that, in that job, right? If that job's gonna take a minute, how far in is, it, in is it? If you break the work up, then you can simply look at the queue lengths of the other pieces to see exactly how fast you are progressing through the work. It's much easier to monitor. All right, so we're coming towards the end. I'm gonna give you some further reading. Uh, this book, Release It, by Michael Nygaard, is probably the best book out there on availability patterns. It has the worst title of any book, considering what it covers. It has very little to do with um, uh, continuous delivery or shipping software. It's everything to do with keeping your software running in a production environment at scale. And uh, Michael Nygaard is kind of the expert in all this. All the patterns we covered today, most of them are actually in Michael Nygaard's book. If you are interested in building microservices which kind of have more of an SOA feel, particularly how you do decoupled invocation, queues between things, then I. Uh, Arnon's book is still probably, for me, the best book out there on that kind of approach, right? So the version of SOA he covers is very much a microservices kind of version of SOA. Do we have any .NET developers in the room? Okay, those of you doing .NET, this is a library that um, we built at Huddle in 20% time, uh, and this lets you do uh, decoupled invocation very seamlessly. So essentially what happens is it's a command dispatcher model and you can either dispatch in process to a handler or you can dispatch between processes. And the programmer just has to write a command and a handler and you just configure some routine to get it to the right place. Uh, other systems exist which do similar things like mass transit and service bus. Okay. All right, quick summary. So we talked about what we mean by fault, failure and error. We suggested essentially that it's impossible for us to prevent faults from occurring. So we again need to take some action about that. We suggested that essentially from our point of oh, what's today's thing about one? Yeah, okay. We then looked at some availability patterns that you can use to recover from faults when they do happen. Looked at timeouts, looked at retries, circuit breakers, throttling decoupled invocation, competing consumers, and parallel pipelines. Right. Okay, guys, because we're running late from the previous session, I'm, I'm very aware that um, uh, I may want to get lunch, so I'm always happy to take questions over lunch. But if anyone if someone wants to go now, feel free. And then I want to actually ask questions here, I'm also happy to take questions here. But I don't mind if you suddenly go, I'm really hungry and I'm running away, okay? Uh, okay, thanks very much.